thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon for another Learning Through Landscapes webinar. Uh, my name is Gordon. I'm one of the Learning Through Landscapes training officers. Uh, and this afternoon, we're going to be looking at place responsive learning. Uh, it's great to have you all along with us, whether you're watching on Zoom or on Facebook. Um, and a huge thank you in advance to the team that are helping in the live stream at the moment. So a big thanks to both the Claire's, Alex and Jill. Uh, they're there to support you with any questions and queries that you might have. Uh, and they'll try and answer some of the questions there. And they will also forward me some other questions as well, so we can have a bit of a live discussion with our panelists. Um, and speaking of, we are very fortunate to have another very highly knowledgeable and uh, experienced group with us. Um, so a huge thank you to Matt Robinson, the LTL Scotland Director, uh, and Greg Mannion uh, from the University of Stirling. Uh, we're also joined this afternoon by Carly Sefton, who is the LTL CEO. So thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, and I'm just going to pass over now uh, to Carly to get us started. So thank you. I'm going to pop into the back uh, and try and keep things running. Carly, are you on? There we go. Sorry, Gordon, I lost you there for a second. I think I had a bit of an issue this end, so apologies for that. Right. So welcome, everybody. It's a delighted, I'm delighted to see so many people joining us today. Uh, like Gordon said, my name's Carly. I'm the CEO of the Learning Through Landscapes Trust. Um, a bit of disclaimer from my end today. I have a small terrier under my desk and a wooden floor. So if you hear any, those sounds like stilettos, tritty trotting, that's probably Hoggle trying to leave. So for the moment, he's just keeping my feet warm. So a little bit about Learning Through Landscapes. Learning Through Landscapes is seen as the UK's leading school ground charity. We specialise in the use of school grounds um, and we support play, free play, natural play within the school grounds and local green spaces. We mainly though support teachers and educators to teach the curriculum outdoors. We love Forest School, we love all of the different organisations that do that but what we do feels quite different and a lot of people that work with us say what we do is unique. Um, one of the things that makes us unique is the majority of our staff are teachers, ex-teachers or educational specialists. So we come understanding the challenges you face daily. So we are champions of experiential learning. Uh, this comes from an ethos set up by our, one of our founders. Merrick Denton Thompson OBE who is a landscape architect who had the unique experience of growing up in Africa and in the Falkland Islands and when he came to start working in the UK as a young man uh, in his early 20s his first job was as a landscape architect in Hampshire looking at school grounds design and he was absolutely appalled to discover that most children just had concrete as their daily connection to nature. Um, as part of our projects, because we are so inspired by Connection to Nature, we've won numerous projects, including the National Lottery Project of the Year Award for our pollination project in 2018. Uh, I think the thing we're most proud of is that we've levied over £25 million into schools, and that's something we still do today. We are a grant-giving organisation, and um, there are numerous grants we've given over our time. The current one, which I would suggest you look at, is the Local Schools Nature Grant, which offers free outdoor learning equipment and free CPD uh, into your school. So it's worth looking at that after this if you haven't already. We mainly work across the UK, but we're involved in new numerous projects in Europe via Erasmus and we work in Asia as well but we have our accredited network um, in Australia and Canada um, which is wonderful so the LTR message is spread far and wide. These are some of our publications. At the moment, most, I think all of these are going to be free online. During the COVID crisis, we've opened everything up to be free, including all our lesson plans. So please do have a look. They cover all key stages from early years through to 18 um, and look at the curriculums across the four nations and internationally. So it is worth looking there if you're ever looking for some inspiration. Our wonderful team have also made a lot of these parent focused. So if you are a parent or have friends who would like to come do outdoor activities with their children, then please do have a look at what we provide. 
So one of the big things we're doing at the moment is looking at how we can support schools, teachers and educators as we believe the um, lift is going to happen on our lockdown. Um, there's a lot of discussion going on at the moment what social distancing looks like in schools. Um, it's very different across each key stage as you can imagine and we're really keen to look at how the outdoor space in your school, however big or small, can be used to support outdoor learning so children can return to school safely. So I'm really keen to get involved and have conversations with any teachers and educators out there who'd like to be involved in developing this piece of work. Uh, we currently have two courses that we're setting up and you can find those on our website. At the moment they're skeleton courses but they're going to be hand-holding courses to help support teachers if you haven't done outdoor learning before and you're being asked to as part of returning with children using social distancing. So please do look at those, but also please do get in touch if you think you'd like to be involved in the conversation or you have expertise or experience about working in schools with, with social distancing. We'd really love to hear from you. And finally, a word from our amazing patron. I am so honoured to always say that our patron, among others, is Sir David Attenborough. And a few years ago, he, wrote, he made a film for us, which you can find on our YouTube channel, about the use and the importance of school grounds. And as part of that, he said this now quite famous quote, if children don't grow up knowing about nature and appreciating it, they will not understand it. And if they do not understand it, they will not protect it. And if they protect it, who will? Now I can never say that as well as Sir David does, but you will know if you follow his work that he's used that in numerous things since publications and on his BBC shows. So we're really proud that that inspiration came from a quote from us. And please do have a look at the video. It gives a great idea of how um, space can be used outside and how important it is to protect it. So now I'm going to ha hand over to the proper experts in this, uh, which is definitely not me. So firstly, we're going to be listening to Matt Robinson and then we'll be passing over to Greg after that. So over to you, Matt. Thank you, Carly. Uh, let me just screen, screen share and then we can get going, everybody. There we go. Brilliant. Um, just to say my uh, view of outdoor learning is probably a little bit different from yours and it's probably a little bit different from the person next to you. Um, learning outdoors, outdoor learning, whatever you want to call it, means a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, and I think my journey into looking into some of this sort of place responsiveness was about starting to see how different people saw it. And potentially there was some uh, benefits to having a much more balanced approach to doing that. So whatever outdoor learning means to you, Welcome this afternoon. Um, the plan is for me to talk through some of the uh, research, some of the evidence behind it, start talking about some of the projects. Greg particularly will come in there and share with us a number of the projects that he's been working on in Scotland, some of the learning from the teachers and the pupils themselves, and then we'll head back into some maybe more specific resources that can help you to do this thing. Uh, and everybody who's attending today, we've got a follow up email and that's got all the specific links in. So, where we refer to books or websites or specific resources, they will be in the email, you will get them afterwards. So. The sense of place has come out of a lot of things, um, maybe the last sort of 50 to 100 years, and I think particularly in the last probably 30 to 40 years, we've seen a real uh, move to this. It's come through a lot of the societal change and, and now alarmingly the, the speed of environmental change that we're seeing as well. A certain sense of maybe placelessness, as people move more, uh, maybe feel less connected with the places, the communities, um, the things that are, are there day to day. And perhaps uh, I would say maybe an imbalance in some of our approach to teaching and learning that's, that's excluded that local context, that, that place that children understand and know firsthand. That's a map view of the world, by the way. One stream of outdoor learning really focuses on, on personal development. It's about the person, it's about what they learn, it's about how they change. Um, it's, it's all about levering what we can to improve character, uh, to produce more rounded people, more aware of themselves. Another one I've seen lots of um, is where we, it's, it's about the activity, it's about the recreation, it's about learning the skill. I want to paddle a canoe, I want to be able to paddle the canoe so I can head down the river. And we put a lot of effort into those activities and the skills that go with them. 
And the third stream of outdoor learning is often about the environment. We want to know the science behind it. We want to know all about those environmental issues. I want to be able to identify plants and understand them in, in, in quite deep detail. And my personal experience of those three is that they're wonderful. But actually, if we focus on one too much, it's potentially to the exclusion of the others. So there's now an argument that perhaps we need to look at something a little bit more balanced, something that, that revisits all of them without excluding one of them. So a useful kind of way of looking at it here. Education is about in and for the outdoors, and it's about connecting people, place and activity and taking that balanced approach. Question for you. If you look at this picture, look at the grass, look at the logs, um, look at the climbing area behind the trees, the houses, the car, there's a street light, there's a satellite dish. If you were a teacher, if you were going to put some learning on here, what different things could you explore in this area? So just take a moment for yourself, maybe even jot some notes down. What kind of things would you study? Or would your students be interested in exploring and playing on and wanting to find out? Just write as many things down as come to mind. One of the uh, key principles um, when we're talking about place and, and, and what we mean by place is, is by making it very relevant to where learners are. And this is a lovely quote about knowing our local environment and actually then being able to understand global issues. So if you don't understand your local trees and how they're growing or maybe how they struggle through drought or climate change, then how can you understand um, some of the bigger global issues to do with deforestation or climate change? And, and knowing where you come from and, and knowing it personally is really important before maybe we, we, we introduce those big topics and big issues for learners to deal with. An example of this, um, I know so many of you may run topics to do with jungles, maybe with younger children, they explore jungles, they explore tigers. And actually, that's something that for many learners that they'll never go to a jungle, they'll never meet the tiger face to face. They maybe actually don't have an understanding of how huge these trees are or how different the wildlife is. Yet, I'm based up in Scotland. We've got our own jungle and we've got our own wildcat. Um, that's our own tiger. And actually introducing children to their local forests, their local wildlife, means that when we then introduce things like tigers and jungles and bigger global contexts, it is much, much better understood. What kind of things can we study with place? Lots. Um, it doesn't have to be remote, wild places. It's the back streets where you live. It's the school grounds. It's the park at the end of the road. It's the hill you can see from town and maybe you can walk to and get up to the top and see a view and realise that actually there's a lot more going on than you first thought. So think about the many, many different places that you've got. And every school and nursery has somewhere and something it can visit. Beautiful picture um, I took. This is, this is minus nine in the Highlands, by the way. Um, and one of my memories of this day is not the beautiful view. It's the people I was with and the experience that we had together. And we actually did a few activities. We even went paddling in the water, would you believe? And it really kind of made that day stick in my mind. And it's about how we visit these places, not just where we're visiting. I was fortunate enough to be at a stunning place like that. But it was how I visited it, not just where I was, that was important. Lots of things we can study when we think about this. Um, we can think about the geography, wildlife, uh, the people, the history, the culture that's gone before us that aren't. Interestingly, some of the history and what we might call stories of place don't actually have to be true. They can be myths and legends. We can make these things up. We can get children telling their own stories, putting themselves in, in the shoes of people that maybe they imagine were there, or maybe might be there in the future. So lots and lots of different aspects, and that'll bring us on to a few bits later. 
I took this from a really good book that you'll get a, a, a link to. And the orange is, is Matt's take on it and some of the things I teach teachers. So good signpost for are we doing sort of place responsive learning? Do we spend enough time in a place? Do we go back to the same place time and time again? And when we get there, do we actually spend a bit of time there? We don't just rush through. Do we find out stories, people, history about this place? Do we get the children to make up their own stories? How do we encourage people to ask questions? Maybe ones that we as the teacher didn't think about. I'll come on to that in a moment. And really important, do we get the learners to share their experiences with others? We put the learners in the place of being a teacher and they teach what they have learned to others. Asking questions can be really quite straightforward. Uh, these are my little cards that I use and we go out to wherever we're going. We put these on the floor, we put stickies on them. And as the children go round, they have to ask questions to do with physical landscape or social landscape. And if they're too young to understand some of those phrases, then I use the pictures and children very quickly get the idea and we help them and they write their own questions or we, we write them down for them. And from that, we've got something we can go away and learn about. I'll just remind you, this takes time. You do have to go back. You have to ask questions. You have to answer them, go back to the place, and maybe it'll provoke some more. Maybe as a teacher, I just need to give a, a few moments to kind of switch on senses, get students into the place that they're at before I start inflicting my timetable of learning on them. Early years is very, very play-based. Um, interestingly, I walked into a uh, nursery, the other side of the world in Asia, and one of my overwhelming feelings was I could have actually been in the UK. I couldn't tell that this was somewhere in China. And one of my feedbacks to them was that place needed to feel like you were in China so that children, even from a very early age, got a sense of where they were and a sense of understanding exploring the things that they find, not passing up the bug that they find or the muck in the woods. Um, the water, the picture, I'm in Scotland, we have lots of water, so we use it as a context of play. Picture here, some of you might know Juliet Robertson, Scobers Moor, story going on there in the early years. Um, starting to explore our local places, leaving the school and nursery grounds and finding what is around us and who is around us as well. And some of those maybe being some very early experiences of meeting animals or meeting members of the community or places we've not been to before as young children. A real um, balance of experience for them. Primary school, I'm going to hand over to Greg in a moment. Um, just a lot of work in primary school, again, is about going back to familiar places on a regular basis and planning activities that maybe use the outdoors to stimulate thinking. Start to put skills in context. So instead of story writing sat in a classroom, choose a cold October's day to go and write your ghost stories down the park, sat on a misty morning under a big old tree. And I guarantee you will get better stories out of the children than sat in the classroom trying to write the same ones. Lots of stuff that's sensory as well, um, using the different seasons, using the different environments and places around them. Uh, Greg's run a really uh, good couple of projects, which he wants, is going to tell us about now. Um, so, Greg, over to you, and uh, I'll be back with you in a moment. Thanks, Matt. Uh, that's a really nice introduction. And uh, just before I begin, thanks very much to you and to Carly and the others in Learning Through Landscapes and Gordon for the IT uh, support as well in, in, in this invitation. Just to, it's really lovely to be able to uh, talk about my stuff to such a nice large audience at this particular time. I feel very connected to such a bigger, bigger space. Um, I should share my screen. Uh, I don't know online if you uh, can also see my face while I'm doing the talk, but let's just presume uh, you can see that. Great. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to talk for uh, about 10 minutes about place responsiveness in teaching and learning in outdoor places. Um, the, the word place responsive, I'm going to explain. I have a few takeaways that are really simple. One is a three way split around how we might plan for outdoors in a place responsive way and what kinds of responses we might make. We, we might make. So I've got a five way 
uh, um, possible framework for thinking about response making. So let's just uh, let's just see where we go with this uh, in a short space of time, um, keeping it quite simple, but also based on research. What I really like about uh, the relationship I've had with learning through landscapes over the years is their commitment to doing really high quality CPD that's based on research. Um, and one of the projects, uh, let me just get to the next slide. Okay. Right, there we go. Um, so place responsiveness. It actually comes from a gentleman called John Cameron. He's an academic from Australia. Writing in the early 2000s, he came up with this term place responsive society. And he didn't write about place responsive education quite, but he talked about this need for society to respond to place so that uh, we would have a deeper connection with land and with place. Um, and that it was part of an attitude shift that we needed uh, ecologically. That was 20 years ago nearly now when he started to write about that. So, you know, if we're not there now, uh, we need to be very soon. So place responsiveness in education became a thing that we took up in research circles to, in order to express what we meant by that. And Matt has cited a couple of sources already. In policy terms, just briefly, in Scotland, we have this term learning for sustainability. Similarly, it takes up on this idea of people in place, the environmental, the social, the economic, um, the need for connectedness, and just outlining some of the blue words that I've highlighted in the Scottish context. Um, the sustainability of the, of the future in a just and equitable world. So social justice is just as important, which makes it just, you know, much bigger thing than e an ecological thing, place responsiveness. Um, the sense of belonging also across communities, across the global community, between school and communities that are local and further flung. So place responsiveness has a really broad reach if we can do it properly. So here's a wee takeaway. If you were to think about what kinds of response making you might want your learners to make to a, a given place, be that school grounds or a local area, be that urban or non-urban, you might want to think about a lesson plan, for example, or a set of lessons that encourages some response making on one or more, or maybe all of these frameworks. So can we encourage the young person themselves to make a response to themselves about their personal health, about where they might buy stuff from now on, how they might consume the elements that they find online uh, or in the environment. Um, they may want to make responses to others, other people, uh, be that, that family members or teachers or friends or community members who they might want to work with to grow garden um, uh, produce in the school grounds, for example. They may want to respond differently to plants or animals. Uh, they may want to make a den or a hut for themselves that also mirrors how the animals might want to live. They may want to uh, help with nest sites or with places for hedgehogs to hibernate. At the level of ecosystem, they may be thinking longer term about growing uh, um, in plants and animal plants and creating habitats in the school grounds or thinking about working in conservation terms with others beyond the school grounds doing perhaps citizen science surveying uh, so that the level of ecosystem we are having wider societal impacts. And at the planetary level, what about our carbon footprint? What about global warming? and so on. Some schools are, are, are installing solar panels, for example, on their roofs. Just these quick, a few quick fire examples, but the framework is viable. If you take that away, responding to and with yourself, uh, responding to other people and with other people, to and with animals and plants, and the habitats and the ecosystems and the planet is the wider one. So moving quickly to the project, um, how we got to the place we are at with place responsiveness started about 10 years ago with this project teaching in nature where teachers who were novice and less novice at teaching outdoors primary and secondary came together to visit areas of special scientific interest with the funding from scottish natural heritage to learn how to teach better in these special places the research is all in line at this web link and you will have the resources later if you want to visit it, but a quick, a quick search on Google, I'm sure will find it. And the Teaching in Nature project built on what we already knew to be really good CPD models. We knew that quick uh, two hour sessions, twilight sessions were not really sufficient uh, for a good CPD for teachers. They needed to do things together. They needed to do them over a long, longer period of time. We built that design into the project. Some of the teachers had never taken children outdoors in their entire 
careers as educators in primary or secondary for various reasons. Maybe the head wasn't in favour of it or, or whatever. And we worked through all of these issues with them and they, they shared their uh, ideas and resources as they went through the nine months or so of, of teaching and planning outdoors. And it was amazing what happened. Novice teachers did, uh, did things they'd never done before. Other teachers who were uh, longer standing experts outdoors did also stretch themselves into, in new ways. And, and children had these amazing uh, experiences, which we documented in, and still, they're still there as available as videos for you to look at as are the lesson plans, as are some of the resources that the children created, uh, the work they, they did, the, bit, the uh, poems and, and the artwork. Um, but just to give you a feel for what they were doing, uh, we, 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 you know, some involved technology, some involved uh, visits to um, particular woodlands or bird watching, uh, or in, some were working through Gaelic as well in, in, in the schools in Scotland. Um, but what we did, okay, so we researched these uh, visits made to these special places to work out what were the factors that affected outdoor provisions. Some of the factors were clearly to do with the teachers' biographies themselves, their disposition to going outdoors, whether they had a dog or not. Some were school factors, as I've already mentioned, finance is always an issue. Teaching and learning, well, yeah, did they have strategies that involved pupils in the past? And was there, was there wider support from NGOs and, and partners like parents? But a key thing I want to talk about today was the factors that included the place. So in what way did the teacher and the others involved connect to places and what were those place factors? I'd like to look at those in more detail next. So what we looked at was how do the teachers go about planning to go outdoors? And one of the things we noticed was that some teachers, particularly the novice ones, would sometimes simply spend all of their time managing the event in terms of getting the bodies on the ground into the context where they'd never been before. And that took a lot of time and energy. And when they got there, they sometimes wanted to do things they'd already done indoors. So they lifted and took pedagogies that they were familiar with and put them in an outdoor setting. And in some cases that worked really well, and in some cases it was more ambivalent to the place. So a wee story here is about this uh, photograph of a, of a task where spaghetti is used with marshmallows to create a structure. Uh, this works well indoors on a hard surface, but when you're in 20 degree heat in the Cairngorms, um, the ground is soft and the spaghetti gets wobbly and the marshmallows kind of melt. So if you're ambivalent to the context of the weather or the, the, con the, the site in which you're teaching, there are risks with being a place ambivalent in your planning. Other teachers were more sensitive to place and other teachers did things that could not have happened in any other location. So we use the terms place ambivalent, place sensitive and place essential to talk about various dispositions to thinking about places that we might visit when we teach outdoors. This is only in planning. We don't believe it's possible to be place ambivalent outdoors. As the story about the spaghetti tells us, when you get into a place, we are wrapped up in its weather and in its context, and we are impacted by it. We are in a place always. And whether we like it or not, these are the factors that are going to impact. So we need to be ready to respond to the place as the place impacts on us and vice versa. So that's another takeaway in terms of planning. Can you think about whether you want to be a little bit less place ambivalent and more place sensitive? Are you going to take the chairs and the books and go outside after the uh, lockdown is unlifted? Or are you going to do something that really thinks about place as a starting point for the curriculum making so that the responses that we talked about uh, from Little Dyke, these five way responses can be made? So there's the two takeaways all in one slide. That's really the core of what I want to offer as a view today for a framework for you to think about planning and getting response making going with your learners. Um, some wee slides, I, I don't want to say an awful lot more because of time. I, I think Matt, if you want to just put a finger or three up as to how many minutes I might have left. I, I, have I got another minute or two? Two minutes, okay. So just a, a wee story or two just to finish off. The group on the bottom right hand corner of your screen are, are an epic group of outdoor learners working with an epic teacher who had spent a lot of time outdoors, both in her own professional life and, and elsewhere. These are a group of learners that have our primary school. They've got some of them with special needs and support assistance. They're walking over a slightly wet ground. 
but they're also crossing a river which is low because of the time of year and they're heading right into the hills in the darkest corners of the upper valley of the upper glen where they're going to do some history research other teachers did less adventurous things uh, other teachers worked really hard to be inclusive and, and bring cheap people with who are wheelchair users into areas of special interest others worked with locals working on horseback or simply opened up local areas of woodland for play so take take your entry point at the level you're at don't expect too much of yourself would be what i'd say if you're new to it uh, make the first steps probably into the school grounds but work in partnership and don't worry about the big wins in terms of learners the big win for you will be getting outside getting to do some task outdoors and getting back again safely and then develop the work later but make that your first goal simply make it a short visit 10 15 minutes and get back inside and then think about who actually did misbehave or did they did they not mostly the teachers find that they don't misbehave when they're outdoors other findings from that project is that uh, the place responsive uh, uh, teachers what did they do well they they thought about person place and activity as a connected thing they thought about the activity they would they would use that brought together the place and the and the young people they also made repeat visits both in planning and with their young people to get to know their place and they noticed differences in the place over time and this drove the curriculum making they also noticed the differences in the response making of the young people and this also circuitously worked back on the curriculum making so as young people respond to the place and as the place changes over time the teachers develop further curriculum ideas this is the kind of work that the really place responsive teachers were getting into as they got into it over time. They also were very clear about the need to respond to contingencies. When a white-tailed eagle flies over your head, you're going to stop and look at it. When the snowdrops are in bloom, it's worth stopping and thinking about those. Uh, don't always be stuck to the plan and expect the unexpected. In terms of curriculum making, start with a place to be responded to and begin from there. That's not the norm for many teachers. We think sometimes we're forced into a perspective where the state perhaps tells us what our curriculum is or what our experiences and outcomes need to be and we start with these objectives. No, in fact, in terms of place responsive teaching, we start with a place and then match those possible activities up with the possible experiences and outcomes that are required of us in terms of the formal curriculum. And teachers were very, were very clear about how they did that in clever ways. I'll say one or two last things before we finish off, uh, just to reiterate, consider the links, make repeat visits, think about the differences, respond to contingencies, work in a relational way, and see place as changing over time. Um, I'm gonna finish with uh, one last thing. I suppose the last takeaway would be just for you to think about outdoor place events. Think about the, uh, the shape and size of the event, how many people are going to be there, what the activity is, but also think clearly and carefully about what's in the place, the materials, the living things, uh, the season. What is each, in, each individual do and what are the groups going to do? And when you connect all of these things together over time, then you'll be thinking about phases of activity that are five minutes long, followed by another 10 minute phase, followed by another five minute phase, keeping the phases really short, doing transitions with care. And you will find that the moving from place event to place event, your curriculum will grow and change and work with the contingencies. That's the other fun part. What a, what a joy to teach outdoors when you actually don't know fully always what's going to happen. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna leave you with a couple of links. Uh, is as well available, paperwork, if you'd like to do the reading of the research. Um, there's lots to, lots to be, uh, to be thought about in this area going forward. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll hand it back to the team. Thank you very much. And questions, of course, very welcome. We'll come back to questions. Thank you, Greg, that's been really helpful. Um, as I said, all the resources, all the bits that Greg's uh, mentioned there, um, we, we will share with you afterwards. So you, you will get that sort of thing. Um, I'm just gonna pick things back up again, if I may. There we go. Um, when I first started at Learning Through Landscapes, I met Greg. This is, oh, seven years ago, I think now. Um, and I take absolutely no credit for this. This is me being drawn in as a parent to my own children's school. But this school, uh, St Mary's, took the ideas that Greg was talking about 
And what they actually said to the students, they were the last year of school, this was their last few weeks at school, they were all about to go to secondary. They said, what would you like to learn about? What would you like your last topic of learning to be? And the answer from the, the learners was very firmly, we've been doing some geography about mountains. Um, we'd like to go to the mountains, we'd like to go do some of it. And so we helped them, and noticed that was a help them, they planned it, uh, a walking journey from one side of the hills to the other. We uh, geocached on the way, we met some history in the, in the shape of the castle you can see. We camped overnight, we borrowed some tents and resources, we cooked our own meals, they had planned their meals. And the next morning we, we walked out, packed up a load of our stuff and, and headed back to school. But um, just, I think, a, a journey through the land for a couple of days that the pupils, it, it will just stick with them forever. And when they got back to school, they still had another week, 10 days of learning and things they wanted to question. We've been jotting down questions all the way through this journey. Um, so absolutely inspiring piece of work. As I say, I take no credit other than um, I was one of the parents helping her to some of them along. Uh, and support them, so um, good to them. As you in secondary school, the process becomes maybe a little more um, explicit in the process. We can, we can approach the learners and say, look, we want you to do this. You're gonna go explore a place and maybe question it. You're maybe gonna go learn about it and then come back and share. And again, there's a couple of really good resources here for it. Just to highlight another case study, this is another school we've had a little bit of contact with. All the students when they start in secondary school have to go on a series of outdoor learning trips to a local park this is walking distance from school and they go one week and it's maybe the art teacher and the geography teacher that take them for a couple of separate hours of lessons in that park and when they go back the next time it's PE and science are taking them and next time they go back it's maths and english and they go back to this park a number of times they do lots of different activities and it's a have to for the students and a have to for the teachers as well. But through that, talk to the teachers and, and they say that the depth of learning, the relationships they build, the questions that are asked and they go back next week and try and answer some and the connections that are made between English and PE, PE and science are absolutely huge. A couple of the tools just to point you at. Greg's already pointed at the Stories in the Land website, very useful to go and visit. The picture there is actually a Duke of Edinburgh trip on horseback following the drove roads across uh, west coast of Scotland. And the resource on the left, which we'll email you, uh, came out of Edinburgh University, a lot of work that Simon Beams did there, Outdoor Journeys. And there's a website with it that's got a really simple model, heading out for a local walk, asking as many questions as you can. Uh, coming back, deciding what are the best questions you're going to, to research, and that's a process in itself for learners. They then research the questions really quite promptly. This can happen in a standalone day, or it could be spread across a few lessons. And by the end of the uh, few sessions or standalone day, the students share their learning with each other. And all of a sudden, in a class of 30, you might have 15 different topics from um, how steep the street is, to who they met there, to where the plane flying overhead was going, to the names of the trees, um, and how much the business on the high street was turning over. Absolutely incredible set of kind of outcomes that, that come from this process. I'm just gonna spin us through a few of the resources that, that we put out as LTL now. So this is the last few minutes, just maybe we'll help you. Those of you who are on lockdown, some of these ideas are deliberately designed to help you, uh, maybe set some ideas and some work while students still aren't uh, necessarily in school and they're working from home. So big takeaway, switch on senses. Can you ask students to go out and lie in the grass and look at clouds and go and explore, but with a real sensory element to it. From that, they're then motivated to write poetry and write more information and things like that. But a switching on of senses. Uh, we have a simple one, something like we give students the alphabet and say write down as many things that you can smell, see, touch, hear, sense along the lines of the alphabet. Use as many different curricular areas as you can. So go back and one session is a math session, the central book there about tree measuring and then the next time we go back we use the tree stories and we tell stories of trees and then the next time we go back it's art 
and the next time we go back we might actually identify what tree it is that we've adopted for those few weeks and by which time the students are really motivated to see their tree and what changed over the last few weeks so it's visited a set of different curriculum outcomes maybe we play games for very early years these can be all sorts of ideas and activities and provocations we put in place the top picture there where you say the uh, lookout tree for intruders was a small woodland I was working in in Fife with a school and we were visiting it with the students every week for a series of weeks. And about the third week we went to this woodland, we walked down with the teachers for a twilight training without the students and we discovered a set of signs hidden around the woodland and outside of us going in in school the children were in there in an evening playing, they set up dens, they set up all sorts of things. The trees were sprouting tree ID sheets and things like this, this was the lookout tree. And we just thought it was absolutely brilliant and showed that even without us as teachers, the learners are extending the learning themselves through play and through their own interest. Finding a viewpoint is a great idea. Anywhere you can see the view, get a map out, draw, sketch the view, gets learners thinking about where and how they are. If you haven't got a uh, hilly grounds, the top floor of school or the top floor of a borrowed office block or something would do to be able to see over those views. For those of you who know David Sobel, this fits in with some of the, the, the prospect theory of play as well that he talks about. Timelines are a really powerful thing. What goes before? And it could be just seasons, the change of seasons. We go back to the same place, see the same tree in four seasons. It could be that we actually put dates down and the middle picture is maybe uh, children representing a timeline in their own way. The picture on the right is a group of teachers I was working with. And we went to the War Memorial in the park. We took a name and pulled out our phones and we used the Commonwealth Graves Commission and actually researched the names that were on there. A really powerful learning experience that these just weren't names, these were people from the town that we were in. And I know a number of the teachers went on to use that with their students. So thinking about time and how you represent what's gone before in a really powerful way. What's in a place name? There's some really great resources from street signs and names. Just Google the name of your street, Google the name of your town. Um, through to the picture on the left is the National Libraries of Scotland. I'll send you the link to this, where for the whole of the UK, you can overlay ancient maps onto new Google Maps. And again, you can then click on place names and it takes you into the information about the name and the place and what went before. And you discover some, some fantastic bits of history and meaning behind those place names. These are all resources, by the way, that we've got out this week. And the final one is, is quizzes and tours and trying to map your street and maybe setting little problems and challenges. A picture of the chalk below appeared on the street near me in Stirling last week. Not set as a piece of schoolwork, it was just a group of children fancied setting a quiz for anyone walking by while we're down on lockdown. And so they chalked it out on the street and any passerby could take part in the activity. And again, it just showed that motivation of children to find out for themselves and share that information is so powerful. If you want a bunch of these as activities, our website's got them on at the moment. I'll be sending you the link to be able to download these. All those things I've just spun through are there. And they are deliberately designed at the moment to be able to use in lockdown. But I also hope you'll really quickly see how you could transfer these into um, back in the classroom, back into school, starting again with your classes and how you can use it. So where to start? If you don't know your local environment, you can't do this stuff. And I know so many teachers when we do this, when we take them on a walk around their local environment, usually with somebody from the parents or a couple of the learners with them who know the place really well, we discover stuff we never knew existed. And even the most, um, again, I can think of a school I'm working in at the moment, the most ordinary of, of 1960s housing estates and yet on the edge of that we've discovered a patch of woodland that is absolutely fantastic and at the same time laden with history and interest and excitement and that school's starting to take their students there regularly but it wasn't a patch that necessarily had been explored much before. When we go we ask lots of questions and we're listening to the students as well and the other one that really helps is who can help us in the community? Who knows the story? Who can come and tell us things that we didn't know? 
Um, obviously, at the moment, that might involve a few more Zoom calls and things rather than face to face. But again, a lovely activity is to get people to ask grandparents, neighbours, community, what do you know about this place? And it's amazing how many people put their hands up and say, um, I was the first person in our house. I moved into the street when it was a building site and here it still is 50, 60 years later and I'm still living here. So some fantastic connections with things. I think Gordon, we're moving on to some uh, questions now. So um, it's uh, over to you. I think you're gonna start shaping us a little bit so we can answer some. Excellent, brilliant. Thank you very much to everyone. That was really, really interesting and provided a huge amount of information as well. I think it's always great to uh, have that knowledge and experience from multiple people. Um, and so thank you both uh, for sharing there. Okay, um, now I've just been collating a few of the questions here. Um, and I think uh, the first question that I was about to ask you um, I think Matt, you have just actually answered that partly, so that is that is great. Um, just uh, any other final points on? So I squashed three questions that I received into one. Um, are some spaces better than others? Are there places that we should avoid? Uh, and then you just answered how to find the best spaces in our area. So any comments from you guys just before I move to the next question? I can comment if you want. You've, you've, you've done a brilliant job of uh, answering most of them, Matt. Um, I, I would say it depends. So, you know, if, if you've got really young learners and it's dangerous, uh, you, you just don't go to a particular place. But if it's older learners and it, it, it isn't there for a safety issue for whatever reason, then let's go to that place. So it, it depends on age, depends on curriculum context. I mean, if you want to teach about uh, um, ecology and recycling, then going to the local recycling centre could be a really cool place to go. It might be smelly, it might not be very pretty. So that ne not necessarily the, the most beautiful place. But if you want to look at a tree as it changes through the seasons, you wouldn't go there. You'd go somewhere else. So it depends on whether you're looking at the ecology or whether you're looking at built environment or history, as Matt described, using the, the context. So best spaces, yeah, there's no really one best space. And in terms of place responsiveness, it's not just about green space, although clearly there's a, an, a, a bent towards green space for various reasons. It improves mental well-being, it improves motivation, it improves uh, all sorts of connections to nature. So there are reasons why some green, some green space or a lot of green space might be important in the, in the mix. Brilliant. Thank I think you. I'll, I'll add to that on the green space. Um, a lot of the green space we're using with schools here at first glance maybe isn't too glamorous but actually what we're working out is that it's not glamorous because people aren't necessarily um, understanding it, caring for it, doing something about it and actually it's really empowering when schools can start cleaning up a space and actually the pupils are involved with that. We maybe need to phone the support a little bit and, and ask councils to come and tidy up. But there's something really empowering about students not only learning about this place but realising that they impact it and they can make a huge real world difference to it. So spaces at first glance don't dismiss them. Uh, my other advice would be don't necessarily think public space. Some of the best learning spaces I've been in with learners um, are things like the back of the office block back of the council building. Um, one of the schools I've worked with uses the front grounds of the very posh uh, Hilton Hotel because we use it mid-morning when there's no guests there and Hilton love having us on site because we tick a big box socially but it's a safe space, green place uh, and they even give us the key to the Safalu so it just makes it really accessible. Um, so think about the spaces you go to in a really open-minded way. Um, there can be some real positives to using a slightly odd space at times. Excellent. Thank you both for uh, some very comprehensive answers there. Okay, I've got another question here. Um, and so I think this is coming from a, a secondary uh, perspective. Um, so how would you make the most of or optimise a 50 minute period if you want to take kids outside as a science teacher? I'll pick that up to start with. Um, one answer is, um, before you assume that's the only way, do explore every possibility. And one of the really uh, great projects that we were on the edge of um, was a uh, local authority who, who actually, and school who actually got I 
I think Matt has just frozen, so apologies there. Um, Greg, are you okay to yeah. give an answer and then we'll bounce back to Matt in a wee yeah, second? Matt's frozen in time. He'll yeah. come back, I'm sure. Uh, the 50 minute thing, yeah, I, I, yeah, it would depend on what you were teaching and it would depend on the routines you already have in place for going outdoors with these particular learners. So if it's their first time outdoors and maybe you wouldn't go outdoors for 50 minutes at all, but if it's a routine and they're normally going outdoors and it's routine and expected, they know where to go, they know how to walk there, they know how to cross the road, um, then it, it might be easily at 50 minutes or longer. If I did have 50 minutes, I would for sure be breaking that up into, up into phases. And normally uh, with an outdoor activity, uh, it's best to do something that breaks the ice and gets things going, some kind of a warm up, some kind of set of small tasks. So think about it in terms of tasks rather than content delivery would be the main thing and having the resources ready and prepped beforehand. Then there's the business of how you close out on a 50 minute period, giving yourself time to come back. And if you're a novice outdoor educator, whatever way you think about it, it's probably going to take twice as long as you think. And then double that as well. So make your objectives smaller scale than, than you might want on the first time out of the blocks. But separately from that, I would suggest that the most important thing I would say around the 50 minute period is connect the indoor 50 minute period before you go to the outdoor 50 minute period and then connect it again to another 50 minute period uh, back in class. So don't see it as a 50 minute period, see it as one event that's linked to an indoor. Now this is actually really heavily researched. We know from good research that the impact on cognition and attainment and achievement is when people connect their outdoor learning to their indoor learning, which is why again, Matt and the others are taking this really clear line on place responsiveness and we do in our research too that place responsiveness isn't just the bit outdoors. Okay. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, and yeah, I think absolutely uh, building up over time and kind of developing that, that routine and expected uh, structure is really, really important. So uh, that's great, thank you, Greg. Uh, Matt, I'm aware you just missed that answer. Any couple of quick comments that you want to add in? Any burning comments? No, I'll pass on that one. Have we got okay. any more? Uh, yes, we, we do. Okay, um, so we've got a um, question here um, talking about the, um, so if repeat visits to a familiar places are so valuable, how do we encourage this and prevent outdoor learning uh, beyond the grounds being a, a one-off or only once or twice a year? Uh, I'm happy to start on that and then pass over to the, to, to the proper experts. Um, I would say it's about making it routine. It's about, as a teacher, starting small and growing big. It's um, about having all your safeguarding in place already, your consent forms, all of those things done. Um, at the beginning of the year, you yeah, can cover multiple trips and our risk-benefit assessments. All of that is online for, to support people in kind of setting up a culture where travelling off-site just becomes a routine part. Of, of your curriculum experience. So they would be my guidelines from a kind of practical point of view. It's just, you know, set out your store at the beginning of the year of what you're trying to achieve and then do it regularly. Um, and also, you know, have the expectations of the children as well in mind. It's when they're big trips, everyone's very excited. There's so much chatter. When it becomes routine, those things are easier to do. So it's just making sure that that routine's in place and the expectations of the children are managed as part of it. Thank you very much, Carly. Um, yeah, and I think I, I, I would just... Um, oh, Greg. You go, Matt. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, I think just to add to that, um, I think there's a couple of obvious barriers that we know of. Um, Carly's already alluded to things like paperwork, and if you don't know what routine and expected is, you need to go and find out what that is. Um, but I think the second one is it is that cultural thing and it's a leadership thing. And if you see outdoor learning as just a good part of teaching and learning, it's not a standalone, it's not a bolt on, it's not something additional. It's just good teaching and learning. That's when you make the difference. Um, my personal experience as well is when you start a culture, it takes somewhere between two to five years to make it happen. And my biggest point of failure in schools to, to regularly routinely go outside is when there is only one person in charge of outdoor learning and the moment that person leaves everything goes out the door with them and if we invest and train only one person then only that person does it and it becomes a yeah yeah i don't have to if 
we turn around to staff and say, this is good teaching and learning, we expect you to do it, and we'll support you and we'll train you, then everybody shares that responsibility. So it's a real leadership issue and cultural issue not to have the one person. That's my biggest point of failure in schools. Uh, last thing on that one, it's a great question. I think one of the other barriers is, is uh, um, ratios and having the right number of people to go with the number you want to bring. Um, so in my case, as a primary teacher of 10 years, uh, what we had were a, a bank of, of, of adult support workers. They were parents mainly, but not all parents. And the janitor was great too. Uh, he, would, he, would drop, he would drop everything and, and come on a Friday. He, he had to have a bit of notice, but uh, he would always come with us and uh, help us get across the road or whatever. So yeah, local is better. That's another solution. And literally, like within a kilometer, uh, you're almost therefore so close that you can call on the school for first aid support, for example. So there are some things then that become a lot easier to, to win and, and, and uh, not crossing too many main roads, maybe. Um, but then making it a routine for yourself and the children. So my commitment to ch children when I was a teacher in my last few years was to say to them, every month in this classroom, you will go outdoors either for half a day or a full day. Uh, it's not actually a lot, but uh, it was quite epic, the, the, the idea that these children felt they could leave the building with a rucksack or, or very little and, and travel somewhere locally for a half a day or a full day every month. And that meant September, October, November, we did three trips before Christmas and so on. And literally, um, all we had to say was, I created a mythological story that about one child that once got prevented to going on one of these trips. And it never actually happened that I prevented any child from going on any of these trips. But uh, the, 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 the motivation and enthusiasm children had for these trips meant that actually for the rest of the month, I had also children who were really well motivated and behaved. Um, and I had this thing to look forward to myself, which made me focus on where I was going to go at the end of that month. So keep making it a routine making it a public thing telling your head teacher and then getting other people on board i know teachers who do bring other teachers on board by by bringing them along and as mentor, mentees in that in that journey brilliant thank you that's a very comprehensive answer from uh, our panel there okay so we are just approaching five o'clock now we've got a couple of minutes left so i'm just having a uh, wee peek i've got a couple of questions and um, coming in from different sources so let me just quickly uh, get one for you. Okay, so we have um, a question that came in um, about do you have any specific input um, on working particularly with young people with autism when taking this type of approach? Uh, can you give you a couple of seconds, give me a nod and I can... Um, just on the it? research front, there is some really good research on ADHD and on autism where uh, they, they, they know that it has a calming effect if you're using green space particularly. So I would think about green space, think about uh, maybe loose parts, um, but also going on shorter journeys and having obviously the support worker uh, to hand, but, but being open and flexible would be the other one. I, I'm going to hand over to other expertise there, but the research is quite strong in this that you may find that actually some of the issues um, are less so outdoors. Uh, I used to run a project for um, adults with learning disabilities, but also uh, with children um, across different things, people with feral units and children with um, various special needs. And I would say that absolutely it's about knowing those children, and young people really well, especially around autism and what their expectation is sensory. So be aware of smells, of noises, traveling on main roads. So I think if you're going to, I imagine small groups, just make sure, as I'm sure you do as educators, having that knowledge for triggers, uh, from parents and carers so you can write that into your risk benefit assessments but absolutely it, do it it's you know where you can do it as Greg said the benefits in the research suggest that all of this outdoor experience and sensory learning is really important um, there are numerous groups that we can put you in touch with who work in this area a lot more than we do in the SEND area and we could uh, definitely put you in touch with them to get more advice if you need it so do drop us an email or contact us through there and I can follow that up Brilliant. Um, get any friendly comments on that? Uh, I've got one more. I think we've got time for one more. Um, so we've got a question relating to research and early years. Um, so a comment that came in was, in early years, half the battle is convincing parents uh, to go outdoors in all weathers with their children. Uh, do you have any research which proves the importance of being outdoors 
uh, in relation to immuni immunity, communication, fresh air, or other related. Uh, and I shall leave that. <laughs> I almost want to throw that back to you, Gordon, being our earlier specialist. But yes, we do. Um, again, there is so much research in this area to look at communication, language development, the use of play outdoors. Um, so we will make that available. I, there is not one piece at the moment I can put my mind to, if anyone else can, to say this would be the better go to. But there are huge amounts of it. And we work with numerous organisations uh, and a couple of professors in early years outdoor education education so there is huge amounts of research in this area and I would absolutely make that available to your parents especially in early years um, it's really good to start that journey early that routine early so then when they go into you know early years is where they have the most access to nature and the most access to free play in their entire education um, and I think children have really benefited from that through outdoor nurseries and through having a really positive outdoor curriculum we definitely see the benefits of that when they start in primary and then further on into their education i will open it up to greg as a researcher um and gordon maybe back to you to finish that off with any of your experience right, okay yeah i mean there are, as you say there's a lot here but uh, I, I would i would be thinking that that question is so culturally imbued it's not a question that would be asked in so many other countries and in, in different parts of the world so therefore you're starting from a difficult place but then i would also wonder if that person is in the minority so these days i think the argument has been won publicly on so much of this uh, there will be class differences and there will be regional differences but if, if you have the majority of parents, and I think you probably do have the majority of parents already behind you on this, then it is only a case of doing it and watching the benefits accrue because the, the research is there. It's not, it's not, there's no need to go through all of that in many ways. Um, but the other thing to do would be to maybe start in the grounds of the nursery. If, if the grounds of the nursery are already uh, either available or in use, if they're not in use, if they're not rich and diverse, then make them so, so that you can then get to the areas beyond the, the, the nursery uh, or the early year setting. Uh, remember, one of the teachers in, in the Teaching and Nature Project hadn't been outdoors in 15 years teaching primary one. Um, and one of the things they did quite, quite quickly with success was uh, some parents gathered together the money to, to get everybody kitted up with outdoor wet gear because Scotland and wet environment. And once they had the wet gear and, and borrowed and begged and uh, shared the, those materials, once they had the, the, the technologies ready for the kids to be outdoors, then everything else fell into place quite quickly. Thank you, Greg. Um, and I'll just uh, say that um, absolutely um, communication is so, so important. And I think inviting your parents into your setting um, and whether it's early years or, you know, it can be uh, later stages of education as well. Um, that communication is so important. Um, something that we often do are stay and play days. Um, and that's particularly for those parts play in the outdoors. Um, and we often open them up to our parents uh, to come in as well. Uh, and it's great the response that the parents have to be able to see things going on uh, live and in action, um, as well as that on nurturing nature. Uh, one of our big pieces of work uh, that I help run, uh, we regularly take groups of families into local outdoor green spaces. Uh, and often they're, they're not the glamorous uh, green spaces that you might see in a glossy magazine. You know, they're at corners of uh, scrubland and kind of reclaiming bits of park. And again, so often it's just that real life experience. Um, and some of the comments from parents have been that there's a bit of a gap where actually quite a few parents um, didn't go out themselves. And so it's maybe something that they've not experienced themselves. So for us to allow that uh, opportunity and experience can be really, really positive uh, and get everyone on board. Okay, uh, I am aware of time now. So we are just at, uh, just after five o'clock now. Um, so can I say an absolutely massive thank you um, to our panellists for all that have been involved, um, to Greg, Matt and Carly. Um, it's been great to have you along with us. I hope you have found it interesting and useful. Um, and please do remember to join us online uh, to stay up to date on all of our activity. Uh, you can find us at Learning Through Landscapes or LTL on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Um, and you may wish to consider to sign up to our newsletter as well. Um, and that can keep you up to date with what is going on. If you do work in a school and you are based in the UK, then please do also remember to check out our local school nature grant. Uh, that's LSNG, local school nature grant. 
uh, for the opportunity to receive equipment and training from some of our fab uh, training team. Um, so a huge thank you again. Um, I'll just quickly pass over to, to Greg to see, is there any um, self-promotion or links that you want to... Thank you very much. It's been, it's been a pleasure and, and thank you for inviting me. It's been, it's been great. Uh, and any further questions, I'm happy to field through email and uh, for resources or research, yeah. Excellent. So thank you all very much um, and please do take care uh, and stay safe and we shall be with you again soon. All the best.